Um, lately, I was in a group of other pastors. Now, your pastor wasn't in this particular group, but uh, we were studying a book together. And some of y'all might have read this book. It's called The One Thing. Anybody read this book? Well, it's, it's worth reading, especially if you're a business guy. This particular book is written by the guy who is, uh, I think his name is Gary Keller. And if you're familiar with the organization Keller Williams, I mean, real estate folks, I mean, that's a big, big concern. And so Gary Keller and a friend of his named Jay Papasan, I think it is, wrote this book called The One Thing. And so the guy who was leading this group of pastors was trying to teach us how to be more effective. And one of the things that's a message in this book is the way to be more effective is to find out what is your one thing. Don't let anything distract you from that one thing. Now, one of the things that's true about ministry in general is there are a million things we're all supposed to be doing. And sometimes there are so many things that we need to be doing, caring for, worrying about, that we get cluttered and we don't pay attention to the things that matter the most. So it's good. It really was a good study. But got to thinking about that whole concept of finding your one thing. Now, one of the chapters in the book is about how to, after you find your one thing, how not to let anything distract you from your one thing. And it even has a chapter in the book about how not to let other people distract you from your one thing. It has a chapter in there about how to say no to people who ask you to do stuff. You should have read it, Brian. You should have read the book. <laughs> I'm glad he wasn't in this, in this study with us. But it's teaching you how to say no to people. It's teaching you how to not let anybody interrupt you. It's teaching you how when somebody else has a project that's important to them, how to, how to sort of offshoot them someplace else so you don't get tied in. And none of your energy is, is siphoned away to anything except your one thing. Now, I got to thinking about that concept. I'm not trying to tell you anything about whether the book is a good book or a bad book. But I got to thinking about that concept of finding one thing and finding a way to wedge everybody else out of your life so you don't get distracted away from your one thing. And I got to thinking about how the Bible would refer to that. Or what would God say to this concept of me finding just one thing and simplifying my life and pushing everything else out to the edges so I don't get distracted from my one thing so I can be more successful, I can be more efficient, I can be more, quote, effective. So I, last night I picked up my concordance and I just opened it up and started looking for not just the concept of one thing, but one another. And I didn't even I didn't look at the Old Testament. I just I didn't even look at all the New Testament. I just started in the book of Romans and started going down with my finger and, and just making a note for all the times the Bible does not refer to my one thing, but it refers to one another. And I stopped at 50 times. From the book of Romans to the book of Revelation, I didn't even look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts. I stopped at 50 times where the Bible talks about not my one thing, but me paying attention to one another. I mean, y'all are probably familiar with this. It's stuff like love one another, admonish one another, salute one another, care for one another, serve one another, be kind and tenderhearted to one another, comfort one another, pray for one another. It goes on and on and on. So I just have to ask, which of these two lifestyles really deserves my primary attention or your primary attention? Is it my one thing or is it this thing called one another? You know, I'll be the first to tell you this morning that focusing on one another is not necessarily the most efficient approach to life. Any of you in these committees we heard about this morning, you got a committee meeting that has two people and you try to bring in just one more and get your phones out after, on the front porch today and decide when we can all get together and make a decision about something. It's just amazing how complicated it gets just trying to get two people together, three people together for the simplest thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's not efficient. It'd be way more efficient for me just to make that decision myself than try to involve other people. But here it is in the Scripture. God tells us to be concerned about one another. It may not be efficient. It may not even come natural to us. I saw Brian this morning had a, a little kid in his hands and he's talking about getting grandkids. Brian, Debbie and I have been blessed with eight grandkids at this point in time 
And uh, let me say, at our house on Sundays, Debbie, when she's feeling up to it, Debbie will have all the family over for Sunday dinner. She's doing it today. And they don't all make it on any particular day, but of these eight grandkids, I mean, that makes there 16 people around our table on Sunday. And of these eight grandkids, five of them are age four and below. <laughs> Can you just imagine what it's like around our table? It's like a beehive in our living room. You know, it's like, and, and I can just tell you that of our grandkids, I cannot watch them and say that it's natural to them to focus on one another. They like to focus on my one thing. And so, you know, in the last several years, Debbie and I have had to referee hundreds of skirmishes over who gets to play with the Legos, or who gets to swing first, or who gets to sit in a certain place, or who gets the first piece of cake. And it's like, I wish I could tell you that these skirmishes are just minor skirmishes, but they're not. They are full-blown, hair-pulling, you know, biting, slapping, hitting, I mean, full-blown wars. Because it's just not natural for us to love one another. We like to focus on our one thing. But regardless, whether it's efficient or whether it comes natural to us, I'm pretty sure if we all took a poll this morning and asked the question, which of these two sides does God want us to come down on? I mean, wedging everybody else out of my life so I can focus on my one thing and be more effective and successful or paying attention to one another. And I think we all know the answer. God sets great store by our paying attention to one another, doing life together. Just what we've seen here this morning, recognizing one another, saying thank you to one another, appreciating one another, valuing one another, not just one another's contributions, but valuing one another ourselves. And so if we ask the question this morning, why is it that God sets great store on our valuing one another? are doing life together. I don't have the full answer this morning. I, there's a whole lot more to say about it than we can say in just a few minutes. But I want you to look, if you will, with me at the book of Ecclesiastes in the fourth chapter. It'll be a familiar verse with you, and I think it'll just give us a, a few hints to answer that question. Why is it that God sets such great store by you and me as His church valuing one another, doing life together? working together. Here's the passage. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. You know, I think when I read that text, especially verses 10 and 11 in it, I think one of the reasons that God says that we need to set great store by caring for one another, we need to do life together, even if it's not efficient, even if it doesn't come easily or it's not natural to us, and we would rather just focus on our own concerns. One of the reasons that God teaches us to pay attention to and give great value to one another is because valuing one another at the end of the day is the key to perseverance. The key to perseverance. I, recently, I read an article by John Stone Street about happiness in the United States of America today. And apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently, however they measure happiness for the last 50 years, the happiness levels of Americans has been going in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not here today to tell you all the reasons why that's true. But these folks at the University of Chicago had done a study where they measured hundreds of different factors in life. So they looked at things like where you live and how old you are and what your job is and how rich you are and how much education you have. And none of those things correlated to happiness. There was only one thing that across every one of those categories, whether it was education or location or whether it was your gender, whether it was your age or how much money you have, there was only one thing that correlated against all across all those factors. And it was whether or not somebody, get this, was married. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that sounds to me, that strikes me as a little funny. 
Because when I turn on the TV and I see things about the messages we get in the culture today, it's like the idea of being married is not in not held in the highest regard, at least as much as it used to be. Maybe that's why happiness has changed. The idea that I get is that, you know, the place where the fun is is in being single, being completely unencumbered, being able to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. Instead of having all the responsibilities of married life. And we hear these jokes and marriage is like a ball and chain or marriage is, you know, it's not just settling down anymore, it's just settling for something less. But there it is. In fact, the statistics were not minor. There was a 30% difference across all these categories in terms of how happy folks were based simply on whether they were married or whether they were not. And I asked myself, why is that? Maybe the answer is because that's how God made us. There's that passage in the first chapter of Genesis where God said it is not good for the man to be alone. Maybe at the end of the day, we're just not wired to be alone. Maybe we're not wired to do life alone, much as we may be tempted to in the short term. Or maybe it's in this passage we're reading today in, in Ecclesiastes. Maybe there's a hint for us about what we need to be effective and successful in the long term in life. I read the passage, it says, If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. Woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. You know, when you're young and strong in life, when you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof, and you are sure nothing bad's ever going to happen to you, it's kind of hard to imagine the part of life where how many falls there are actually going to be in the long run. And it may be hard for you when you're young and strong to imagine what it's like, how cold it can be to be alone all through every night. Maybe it's hard for you to imagine how much at some point in this life you're going to need somebody who will stand by you and never leave your side. An ally who will never give up on you. But when the writer of Ecclesiastes describes the benefits When he says two are better than one, the benefits are in all those areas where life becomes difficult, life becomes hard, life becomes unmanageable unless we do it together. And this has a hundred implications. It's true in a home, it's true in a marriage. Last Sunday night, we were over at Westside, what used to be Westside Baptist Church, And we celebrated a number of churches. It was our annual meeting, and we celebrated different churches for things that that are taking place. And one of the churches we celebrated was a a young church, a a new church, fairly new, called City Church. Now, City Church started out as Revolution Church some years ago. They were then adopted by, and I won't list the name of the church, but they were adopted by a big church off to the west of here, and they succeeded for a while. Actually, had a couple hundred people have come in every Sunday. It looked like a great success story. But then the pastor at the big church left and the big church decided to pull the plug and all the money went away and what was Revolution Church almost died. And frankly, would have died. Brian Hall at Chestnut Mountain stood up and gave a testimony to the fact that God just put it in his heart that he didn't want to just be a single church by himself. He didn't want to just be effective or successful as a single church by himself. And so Chestnut Mountain adopted City Church and trained a new pastor over several years. They sent somebody to preach week by week. They gave their leaders, they gave their time, and City Church is now healthy and successful and has a great future, and let me just say to you, their ability to persevere was not about having just focused on their one thing. And their ability to persevere as a congregation was not about having the best light show or even the greatest preacher. Their ability to persevere as a congregation was because they were connected. Because they were part of a bigger one another. That's true for congregations and communities. It's true for people, all of us here. It's true inside of church, not just between churches, but it's even more so the case inside of a church. If you're in 
a member and a part of the one another here at New Holland Baptist Church and you've ever been sick for a season, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. And some of you know that my wife, Debbie, is walking through cancer right now. If I go home and I open our freezer, it is full of stuff that people have brought to us, just reminders from people at our church, our community group, people who are part of our one another who come by and I open that freezer and in it is a reminder of God's love for us as it has been expressed through people who bring things by and just put it in our freezer and leave it there. I cannot tell you the difference it's going to make in your life because you're part of one another. It's the key to perseverance. Now, we live in a country today. I don't have to belabor this. You guys know it to be the case. You hear the phrase, cancel culture. We live in a culture today where if you disagree with somebody online about something, the odds are they're going to unfriend you in a heartbeat. They're going to ghost you. They're going to cut you off. If you get on Twitter someplace and say something they disagree with, they'll blister you with words. They don't care about the result of that. It's true in terms of on social media. It's true in politics. It's hard to watch how quickly people will cancel each other, just completely throw away relationships as if we're never going to need these. And can I tell you that this tendency that's true on social media or true in politics even becomes true in communities and cultures, and if you're not careful, can become true in churches? Where simply because we don't agree with somebody, simply because we don't see eye to eye on an issue, that we're going to cancel one another? All I need to say this morning is this is not the will of God. It's not how the church is designed. And it's not what you need as a child of God. If you want to persevere in your life, don't undervalue. Don't fail to see the value of one another that God has given to you as a tremendous gift here at New Holland Baptist Church. All these things the Scripture says, where it says comfort one another, serve one another, be patient with it. All these things are true because God knows you need them. We all need them. It's the key to perseverance. Why is it that God tells us not to be focused just on our one thing, our one idea, our one path to success, what's important to me today, but to give tremendous value to one another? It's because it's a key to perseverance, but it's also the key to progress. It may not seem so because it is inefficient to have to wait on other people or listen to other people or, or coordinate with other people. Yes, it takes time. But at the end of the day, it's the key to progress. Anybody watch the George game last night? Hang on. This is a good church. <laughs> church. I knew there'd be a lot of people who did see the game. <clears throat> so... If you saw the game, late, late in the game, <clears throat> Georgia was winning, I think, by six points. And it was the fourth quarter, and Missouri had the ball. <clears throat> and they're, they're driving, and they're not right about to score, but you can kind of feel like they're about to score. This is going to get hairy and, you know, not going to turn out well for us. And so the quarterback, uh, just inexplicably, he just throws the ball, and a guy named uh, Stackhouse, I forget the guy's first name. Um, anybody know the first name of that line? Nazir, is that it? It's a strange name. For me, it's a strange name. So he throws it right in the belly of this defensive lineman, 320-pound defensive lineman called Nazir Stackhouse. And he starts running for the other end zone. And he is huffing and puffing. My wife doesn't even like to watch football. She loved watching that play. She, she, Let's play that again. Let's see that again. Just watching that big guy run. And when it was over with, now he didn't score a touchdown. He got within the five-yard line. They called the play back, all this kind of stuff. But, but when it was all said and done, people on the, on the, channel, the TV channel and afterwards in the reviews you see, you know, where they're going through all the games, people couldn't stop talking about it. You say, why is that? It's because these are the guys who are always invisible. 
But these linemen, you know, these are the guys, they never have the ball in their hands. They're never the people on the, in the spotlight. They're never the heroes. They don't get talked about. And sometimes because they don't get talked about, they get forgotten. But you ask any coach anywhere, he'll tell you that if you want to be effective in the long run, you got to be effective there in the trenches. Whether these guys get noticed or not, that's not the point. If you want to be effective in the long run, you got to be effective there. You ask any running back, and he will tell you, he'll tell you that progress is impossible without these people, these big guys up front who are unsung heroes. Progress is impossible without them. The same thing's true for us. Progress in the Lord's kingdom is impossible if we try to do it by ourselves. You know, I, I'm not going to take the time to show it this morning, but I got a video. Well, I don't, I don't, it, it'll take longer and you can show it to them whenever you want to. It's on the thing. I showed a video last week at the annual meeting just because I was trying to make this point, not just to individuals, but to churches. And it leads off with a guy named H.G. Gerard, who many of you in this church will know. H.G. Gerard was raised up in a community just uh, up near Suches, and it was so remote when he grew up there, they didn't even see an automobile until 1926. <laughs> I mean, they didn't even didn't see one. He went to school in what was a one-room schoolhouse in his church. His dad was the pastor, bivocational pastor. And when he got to the seventh grade, that was as far as they could go. They had no education beyond the seventh grade. And it wasn't just true for him. It was true all across this region. You get beyond a certain point. There were no schools. If you got to high school, there were no schools for kids to go to. And you know who decided to put schools together? It wasn't the government. <laughs> it was churches. This association started a high school called Chattahoochee High School. H.G. Gerard went to that high school. H.G. Gerard came to be the pastor at New Holland Baptist Church for, what, 36 years? He became the superintendent of schools. The whole community was blessed, and it wasn't because his church up in Suches decided they had to do all things all by themselves. It was because there was such a thing as one another, and we could help each other. And the whole community was blessed. It wasn't just true for him. It was true for hundreds of young people. One another is not just the key to perseverance, it's the key to progress. You know, at, North, at, at New Holland Baptist Church today, I, I listened to all the folks that were recognized. And you, you probably think, I'm going to guess, if you were recognized and part of some committee or doing some ministry, you probably think it doesn't make much difference. But can I just tell you today that in any army, not every soldier carries a gun. In the U.S. Army today, there are people who are cooks and mechanics and drone pilots and artillery officers and engineers and people who do cybersecurity and radio operators and the list goes on and on and on and on. And, and the truth is that if any one of those factors is completely absent, the whole enterprise will come to a crashing halt because we need one another. It's not just the key to perseverance. For churches and people, it's the key to progress and effectiveness for the kingdom. So yes, it's right to honor your pastor, to pay attention to and value one another, to honor your staff, to honor every person in this church for their contribution. But can I tell you this? That what we're really talking about this morning is not just to honor their contribution, it's to honor them. It's not just to value what they do, it's to value them. This is what the Bible's telling us when it says, that we are to pay attention to, to set great store by, to focus on the importance of one another. Because at the end of the day, it's the key to perseverance. Life is long. 
We need each other. It's the key to progress. And how well we value one another as God's church is also the key to whether or not we will impact people. I talk a lot this morning about valuing one another, but there's another simple word for that. It's called love. I went to Bradley's funeral on Thursday. <clears throat> Wednesday, they had posted <clears throat> that the visitation started at 5. It's going to go to 5 to 8, and I thought to myself, there's going to be a long line. <laughs> And I had to be somewhere at 6. So I showed up before 5 o'clock even. And I got to see the family and took off. And I, that thing about being aligned, from what I heard, was the case. I don't know if I've ever heard a longer line. It snaked out through the lobby all the way out into the chapel back <laughs> again. It's, I don't know how long it would have taken to, to wait through that entire line. And I asked myself, as you may have asked yourself as well, why? Somebody might say, well, because Bradley was a teacher. He knew a lot of people. Well, there's lots of teachers. Maybe somebody, well, he was a teacher and a coach. Okay. He knew a lot of people, but there's lots of teachers and coaches, and that's not the response that comes. Maybe you'd say, well, he had a great personality. He had a great laugh. We could all tell Bradley jokes today. And he did. But you know that's not the reason. You say, well, why does one person become so precious to an entire community? And everybody here knows. It's not just because he was a teacher or a coach or he could tell a good joke. It's because he loved people. It's because he did not, he did not push everybody to the corners and wedge everybody out so he could focus on his one thing. He was more concerned with your one thing. So the whole community treasured him, responded to him. He was precious to people who don't even know Jesus. They were probably folks in that line or at that funeral who don't even know Jesus. Don't darken the door of any church, but they knew love when they saw it or experienced it. And I read in the Gospel of John what Jesus had for the church to be and to do. 13th chapter of John's Gospel, the 34th verse, a new commandment I give to you that you Love one another. See that? There it is again. Doesn't say one thing. Doesn't say that you love one thing. It says that you love one another. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. Now stop there just a second. You know, Jesus gave a commission. We asked the question, why should we set such a great store by one another? Why should we value one another? Why should we value one another's contributions? Whether it seems to be a small contribution or a big one, whether you're famous or not famous. You know, why should we set such a great store by valuing one another? It's because it's a key to perseverance. It's because it's a key to progress. And it's because love is the key to how we impact people. And Jesus said, Jesus said that His church is supposed to be about that. He said, if you're going to be famous for anything, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you're going to be famous for anything, it's best that it not be about how great the lights are and how great the smoke machines are and even how great the preaching is. But if you're going to be famous for anything, here's what it ought to be. That you love each other. And people see that. It's so unusual in the world, they can't forget it. And they can't turn away from it. 
It's how we impact people. It's what Jesus commissioned the church to do. He died and gave us this commission to love each other. Love one another. And so this morning, as you value your pastor, your staff, and one another, I just want to congratulate you. You're doing the right thing. If this morning after you leave the service, the Holy Spirit puts in your heart and He says to you, you know what, you need to take another step. You need to write somebody a card. Then I want to ask you to do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow because this message will be old. Hat tomorrow you won't even remember. Do it today. If there's somebody in this congregation that you've become at odds with and you're tempted to cancel because we don't see eye to eye, and we argue with each other. We can't see. We're like oil and water. We're like sandpaper with each other. That's how family works, by the way. But um, if there's somebody you're tempted to cancel, then let me just ask you to get on your knees today. If you want to come take your pastor's hand today and ask him to pray with you about that, that's great. You do it. Or if you want to get on your knees at home today and say, Lord, when can I pick up the phone? When can I call that person, have a cup of coffee, and set that right? I think God would be honored by that. 